Pick Six Podcast. Sam McEwen along with the heavy hitter, Tom Chattel and the silver tongue, Evan Bland. We're here on Zoom again. Uh, we want to thank you for listening. We'll, we'll be back to more of a studio schedule um, here in the upcoming weeks. And then when the season begins, you can always count us on Tuesday afternoons. It's generally when we will be recording uh, the Pick Six Podcast once the football season begins. Um, I want to remind everybody to subscribe to the Omaha World Herald. We have a great deal uh, right now, six months, one buck. Today is August 10th. That's going to take you all the way through uh, the second signing day. Uh, so you'll have all of the coverage of recruiting. Press has done a lot in that area already, but you'll know all the transfers and you'll have the full, full season of uh, Husker, Husker football, Husker volleyball, and most of the Nebraska basketball season uh, will also be in that bunch. And of course, you'll get all the other sports and all the other news from the World Herald as well. So subscribe, subscribe, subscribe uh, to the Omaha World Herald. You can go to www.omaha.com backslash subscribe to get that special deal. Gentlemen, uh, it's getting hot again. It was nice and cool weather all week long. Uh, and now it's about 95 degrees outside. And it's true of the dog days of August when training camp gets a little boring for everybody, including the media. Um, but we had something to spice it up late last week with Oregon and Washington. I want to touch on that off the top. Uh, we didn't get a chance to record late last week, and so I want to talk a little bit about that, and we'll get into Husker football training camp. And at the end, I'll give a little five minutes on Nebraska basketball, which is a kind of a soap opera a uh, little bit, not in a bad way, but in an interesting way. We'll get to that uh, toward the end. Let's start with this. Um, Oregon and Washington, they're in the Big Ten. Uh, they, add, they were joined last Friday, um, and it doesn't feel like it's over. Tom, you wrote a column about conference realignment. Then you talked to John Cook, the Nebraska volleyball coach, on Tuesday about uh, maybe, you know, making changes to the league. And he suggested adding two more teams. Do you think two more are on the horizon or do you think it's going to move all the way up to 32 eventually? Well, um, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know Fox's, uh, um, you know, their, 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 their limits right now. Uh, I don't know why he wouldn't add Stanford and Cal. And have two more in the West. Uh, they, they they both fit the um, the, the Big Ten profile. Um, I just uh, I don't know what it's, I don't know. I, I really think this is about uh, collecting the 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 most TV inventory, the the, the highest rated shows. Um, it's it's about collecting a lineup. Um, and I think they'll go out to the ACC next. Um, uh, it, it's just fascinating to me to go back and read the stories this week about last week. I mean, I, I was, I, I, I was, you know, you know, I, I was going to write a column for Sunday about realignment, and right. uh, as we were as we were driving to uh, Columbia, Missouri, to drop my daughter off at college uh, Friday, um, I didn't have a column. I thought because it looked like the Pac-12 was going to stay together, so. <laughs> I kept thinking, well, it looks like the Big 12 is going to get these guys, and maybe these guys will go this way. And then, you know, I, I put my phone down, and I came back like 20 minutes later, and it was over. Oregon, Washington were going to the Big 10. And, and it was supposed to be Arizona going to the Big 12 first. And it ended up being the Big 12 or the Big 10 made, made the first move. And you know they, we all heard that the Big Ten didn't want to break up or cause the, the Pac-12 to um, go away, and they ended up doing it because they made the first move, and the Big Ten uh, couldn't wait. Uh, Fox couldn't wait. So um, I don't know what's going to happen next because it looked like it wasn't going to happen last Friday that it did. So, but I think all eyes now are on the uh, ACC. Um, Florida State, I mean, the ACC was a wonderful college basketball league. Uh, and they, you know, like the Big East, um, they decided they needed to get into the college football business because that's where all the, the money was. So they had Florida State and Miami and uh, Boston College and a few others. And um, so now Florida State, Miami, and, and I guess even uh, the Clemson and possibly North Carolina are saying, well, we're, we're $30 million behind these big 10 and SEC schools. And, and we're all chasing the same national championship, but they have a, a distinct advantage on us. 
So we want to get the hell out of the ACC because we're locked into our uh, media rights deal until 2036. So we're not going to be making any more money until then. So they're trying to get out of there. We're using lawyers and threats and all this stuff. So they can get with, I mean, what we're headed for is a collection, giant, two giant leagues of the the schools that care the most about college football and have the the, the, the most tradition and, and have the, the means to go after the national championships. Um, that's where we're headed. The Florida States want to be part of the, the Cool Kids Club and, and do that. So they're, I believe, uh, if you believe ESPN, which is which is now which is now gambling on gambling, <laughs> um, is going to run out of money. Um, then the, the Big Ten with its three headed monster of uh, Fox, CBS, and NBC uh, is going to be in, in line to get Florida State and uh, possibly Clemson. And if you thought that would ever happen, uh, you know, <laughs> here's to you. So, um, I think that I think that, that, that that's possibly next. What year? Uh, Won't even see that. I don't know, but um, it's um, I think it's coming. It could come faster than and a lot of people think. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I felt like uh, the thing that stood out to me was some of the comments from Gene Smith at Ohio State and others saying that the Big Ten was not inclined to add Oregon and Washington until Fox came to the table with new money. So it was this idea that, you know, the big 10 membership wasn't interested in diluting their resource pool, maybe dropping from 75 million a year to 70. Uh, but the TV networks are the ones and, and Fox specifically wanted to make this thing happen. And so here it is. And, and nobody feels maybe great about it. Logistically, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but the money is there and, and everybody's chasing the, chasing the bag. And so that's what, uh, what you have. And that's kind of where we are. And, and I agree, Tom, like you look at just the, the minute by minute drama last week of, of how they went to bed that Thursday night, thinking everyone was going to sign a grant of rights uh, agreement moving forward. And then uh, things fell apart Friday morning, two teams were off to the, to the Big Ten, and then the Big Twelve came along and and picked up some of the scraps, um, and here we are. So, uh, competitively, yeah, this feels like we're still in a transition period. Eighteen certainly does not feel like the final number. Whether that's uh, you know they they look into the to the ACC, North Carolina, Clemson, Florida State, what have you, um, or go a different direction, obviously remains to be seen. But very fluid situation, and and just another summer of. Like you just, you don't know what people are thinking behind the scenes, uh, but it does feel inevitable that we're heading toward those, that two super conference model that we've been talking about for a long time. At what point does Notre Dame's uh, board of trustees or the oversight of that university um, basically change its mind about uh, protecting independence? Notre Dame had a unique role this week in encouraging the ACC to add Stanford and California while Notre Dame is not a member of the ACC. And it struck me as a very presumptuous moment. Like we're going to keep doing what we're doing, but we're going to tell this league that we caucus with what to do um, because we feel like that would, that would be good for college football. And at what point, um, does college football begin to just simply freeze Notre Dame out and say, you know what, join a conference or otherwise we're, we're tired of listening to you. At what point does, uh, does one of these uh, university trustees just say, it's time, it's time to give this up. You, you don't have to be independent. You basically caucus with one league. Why don't you consider joining a league um, in football and let's move on. Like you don't, you don't have to pretend that you're somehow getting a better TV deal remaining independent because they're not. Yeah, I, I think it'll happen uh, because, I mean, you know, in today in college football, everything is, there's no more surprises. There's no more um, the, the holy grails, the things that you thought would, would never happen. Um, and so I, but they'll hold on to it, Sam, until they, until they, until they, until they have to let go. And at that point, well, I, I believe the next uh, round of expansion by the Big Ten 
if they, if they, you know, if Florida State gets free, I mean, and I think all this will happen uh, at once. Though Florida State will will make the move when, and they'll they'll obviously know uh, which league uh, wants them, and and uh, if, if there's a deal that that will just happen like that. So, um, if the Big Ten, if the ACC, if they break apart, and you know, the, the Big Ten is is not asking Notre Dame for their you know their their their, their thoughts or suggestions on this. The, all this stuff is happening without Notre Dame's, uh, you know, uh, say so. You know, the the, the, the world is the, the world of college football is 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 kind of blowing up and expanding, and 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 nobody cares about Notre Dame. So, um, all this is going to happen with or without Notre Dame. So. They're going to get to a point where they're going to say, um, "Okay, we've got Florida State, we've got Clemson, pop, you know, maybe Miami, um, and and maybe the SEC then decides what well, we have to do. We need to probably do something. They don't they don't want to do it either. They don't have to do it, um, but at some point they'll probably need to do something. Um, it's just a matter of, of what he has been uh, can pay. But uh, my point is." If if all the the major college football schools are together, and there's only so many playoff bids, and and Notre Dame is, is left to play Duke and North Carolina, or maybe not even North Carolina, but Duke, Wake Forest, um, you know, and and uh, Stanford, which is not in the league. I mean, you know, some of these Navy, I mean, some of these schools on Notre Dame's schedule. Are not going to are not going to have a strength of schedule to offer, so you know another name's chances of getting in the playoff aren't going to be very good. Um, so at some point, they're going to look at that and go, "What you know? Okay, we like money. Where can we make the most money? And two, how do we get in the playoff? What are our best chances of getting in the playoff?" So, I think we're pretty close to that to that to that. Uh, we're getting closer, closer to that place all the time, but I think one more move, um, to the ACC. If the ACC breaks up the football schools, um, that might be the last, the last chess move to get Notre Dame in. I want to talk a little bit about how this this move, the expansion of the league, uh, USC and UCLA and Washington and Oregon affect Nebraska, and I want to be able to do that by telling the story a little bit. Um, it's very old now. It's 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 actually gosh, it's almost it's more than thirty years old. Of what I think the Big Ten expansion can do for Nebraska is similar to something that Nebraska once did for Washington. So most people know that the nineteen ninety one Washington football team uh, won the national championship. It was a great team. They won the coaches side of it. Miami won the AP side of it. The two teams didn't play each other because the Rose Bowl had stupid rules. Washington came out to Nebraska early in that season, like early September, super hot day, 90 degrees, very, very difficult conditions in which to play Midwestern football. And at the time that, that Washington came out here, I mean, they were playing uh, maybe the best league in the country. I mean, you could argue uh, it certainly wasn't the Big Ten at the time. You could argue that, you know, Miami and Florida State were better programs. But as people remember, they were not affiliated with any leagues at that time. They were independent um, like Notre Dame. And so the Big Eight uh, was probably the best conference. The SEC was okay, but it wasn't great. Um, and the Big Eight had produced the most previous national champion in Colorado, and it had produced another you know, national champion in 85, and Nebraska had been in the mix in 83, and all the rest. So Nebraska takes a 21-9 lead in the third quarter of that game. I can't remember who fumbled, but Derek Brown goes over the top for a touchdown. It's 21-9. And there's this famous part in a Sports Illustrated story of Lincoln Kennedy, who was a uh, you know, he's a college football Hall of Famer. He was an All-American lineman at Washington. He's over on the sidelines um, talking to his teammates. They're down by 12. And he basically says, you know, this is the big effing eight. And he meant it as a, he meant it as a compliment. Uh, basically, you can't just come in here and play any old football and beat this team. This is the big effing eight. And he was comparing and contrasting the Pac-10 at that time with the big eight, which was Nebraska. And most people remember that Washington came back, scored 27 straight points in that game, 136 to 21. And I've always believed that that game is what made Washington believe they could do it, uh, that they could they could run the table and win all the games that they had to win. Um, they certainly did that. They were a great program that year and certainly deserved a share of the national championship. 
I think Nebraska in a weird way, uh, although they're not going to be winning any national titles this year, will benefit from this expanded Big Ten in the way that Washington ex and benefited from having to play a program like Nebraska early in 91. Tom's written very, very eloquently and very bluntly about the fact that Nebraska has been sort of locked in this, this, this divisional thing with, with uh, some teams that are in the Midwest, none of which have, have come close to winning national championships. Maybe the 2017 Wisconsin team could have done it, but they didn't. Um, and he's been very frank about how that has maybe hurt Nebraska in some ways. Um, to not have programs surrounding it that uh, were great. They were good, and they beat Nebraska on a consistent basis, but there wasn't an aspiration to it. The neighborhood that you were in um, was far away from the bigger neighborhood of Ohio State and Michigan. Now with the expansion of the league, I do think that Nebraska's job's gotten harder, but I think it actually has a better chance of achieving where it wants to go because there's really nowhere to turn anymore. The way that this schedule is going to break down, if it goes to divisions, or if it goes to, you know, the continued round rob or whatever they want to do with this, with the, the pod schedules, Nebraska is not going to have anywhere to hide. And I actually think it's going to be good for Nebraska to not have anywhere to hide. Um, they're going to have to improve their level of play. They're going to have to, they're going to have to lift their standard of play way up in order to, in order to be where they want to go. Winning nine games in this apparatus is not going to be like winning nine games uh, in the Big 12 North, where Nebraska was for many years, or the Big 10 West where Nebraska has been for many years and they haven't won nine games very often in the big 10 West, but I remember the 2016 team as you guys do and love that team because of the way they rallied around Sam folds, but simultaneously that wasn't a great football team. I mean, they beat Maryland and Indiana and a few other, a few other teams. They weren't very good. Um, they, they went nine and four, but it was a, it was a big 10 West nine and four with Maryland and Indiana also in the mix, uh, the teams that they were playing and the point I'm making is that I just think that it's going to require a more difficult, stringent test for Nebraska to get back to where they need to go. And that rule uh, knows they have nowhere to hide. I mean, he he said it on, uh, I believe, Saturday. He said, hey, you know, our, our program um, doesn't, you know, we, my job is to make Nebraska nationally relevant, nationally relevant. And you're not nationally relevant, no offense to Illinois and Purdue, by beating Illinois and Purdue. You're nationally relevant by beating the teams that are national programs. And by goodness, Oregon is a national program. Washington, maybe not, but Oregon absolutely is. And so is USC and UCLA. And so even though I think Nebraska's task got harder because the teams that have joined the league are better, it's nevertheless, I think, more achievable to go where they want to go. And so I think it's a good thing for Nebraska, but simultaneously, it's going to be a test. Well, I think it goes back to <clears throat> discussions that we've had before here where I, I've always felt like Nebraska's mentality as it shifts into this new reality is already where it needs to be. Like they've already sort of kept an eye on the national level. That's what they aspire to do. That's what their history is. And that's not the case for a lot of their West brethren. Um, you know, Iowa kind of is what it is. There's, that's right. there's a high floor, but, but the ceiling's not that high either. Same thing with Minnesota, same thing with, uh, you know, Illinois, I think, in the way that they're playing right now. So, Iowa has an institutional mindset, and their institution is the Big Ten. Iowa has an institutional mindset. It has served them very well over recent years. Mm -hmm. But when Kirk Ferentz talks at Big Ten Media Days, he talks about 1980 and 1993 and 2002. It's completely institutional. Like it's, And it serves them well within the West. It will not serve them well when they have to go beat Oregon continue right exactly so they might be wet they'll be west contenders they, they may very well win the west this year but next year if it's eight when it's 18 teams what's iowa's ceiling fifth fourth maybe in a, in a great year like that's kind of how i see that and nebraska you know for all of its failings i mean it hasn't been afraid to swing hard to to kind of expand what it wants to do to dream bigger than the West, even though it hasn't won the West, uh, and and you know we can talk about the reasons behind that, but it does feel like now that the football piece is in place with Matt Rule and and, and that staff, uh, you know the, the ceiling is higher for Nebraska, in my opinion, than than pretty much everybody else in the West, and that's why Wisconsin made its move to Luke Fickle, that's right? I think, to to raise that's that right. ceiling as well. So you know we'll see how it goes, but I do think if nothing else the mentality shift that so many members of the West are going to have to make Nebraska's made a long time ago because they were never really the other way. Mm -hmm. no, that's a really good point. I, I, no question. Wisconsin's choice is so interesting to me 
because in so many ways it mirrors what Nebraska did going into the 2004 season. Um, and that was very divisive at the time. Uh, simultaneously, um, you, you can understand why they're doing it. The difference between Wisconsin in 2023 and Nebraska in 2004 is the coach they got. And part of me believes that what has changed in the sport is that Wisconsin could fire Paul Chris, who had a very similar record to Frank Solich, and get more of a shrug from the fan base than Nebraska's fan base could shrug because, A, Nebraska had more success in Wisconsin, and B, the culture's changed. Coaches just, just switch out all the time. I mean, Mario Cristobal was at Oregon, and he had it rolling, and he left. Dan Lanning is at Oregon. He has it rolling. He might leave, too. Like, he might go. I mean, if 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 the day comes when, when you know, job in South Carolina is open or Kirby Smart decides to go to the NFL, who's to say that they won't – people move around so much now that it makes the Luke Fickle Wisconsin move possible um, and the fans aren't as pissed off as they were when Frank Solich was let go. But that's a really good point, that Wisconsin made these changes in anticipation for having to do more than they were doing based on the divisions going away. It's possible they could come back. Um, you know, it's it's possible they could. If you go to 20 teams, there is a logic to having two 10-team divisions with a nine-game schedule, and there is some balance at this point. Like, if you go straight west, there's a balance. Oregon and Washington and USC and U UCLA and Nebraska and Iowa and Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and Illinois and Northwestern and Minnesota. That's a league. Like, that's a pretty good league. Um, you, you're not, but I don't think that's going to happen because there's no way that you're going to keep USC away from Ohio State and Michigan and no way you're going to keep Oregon away from some of the teams on the East. So I don't think they're going to that. I think they're going to have this big, massive, you know, EPL sized standings bracket that you're going to have to flash on the screen every single time. And, and you'll just have to try to try to hash it out. There's going to be a six way tie for eighth. <laughs> it's going to be like, First, tie for second, tie for fifth, tie for eighth, 17th. You know, like it'll, if they go to 18 teams, that is. So, you know, we'll have to see um, exactly what happens. I want to shift our focus uh, to, to, to camp itself. Um, I, I, can't, I, I can't weigh in on all this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, of course. Yes. You can. Yes. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, yeah. If you, well, I, we'll, we'll start with this. Like, as it relates with Nebraska, I, do you feel like um, it uh, it favors Nebraska to go to a bigger league? I assume you do. Like you, I do, I do, and I and uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, you know, they, I, 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 I used the word the word swimming, and it, 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 it totally took the the point away from the focus away from my point, so I won't use that word anymore. But um, look, Nebraska has forgotten how to win, but they have not forgotten how to care. And, the, 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 and I applaud the program and the people because they care more than ever. They're, they're hungry for it more than ever. And um, that's really hard to do. But that means it's in your DNA. Um, th this sort of desire and the hunger for you know winning at the highest level is not in the DNA of a lot of these Big Ten schools because the Big Ten for years was two at the top and then everybody else waited for their turn to go to the Rose Bowl. And that was how you you kind of lived your life. Um, and that's over. The Big Ten, as they knew it, is over. It's Big Ten as in, in uh, name only. And, I mean, from now on, it's uh, – and now you've got two more. You had you had the two L.A.s. Now you've got the, the, the Oregon-Washington coming in. They don't care about Ohio State-Michigan. They don't care about any of this stuff, uh, all, the, all, the, all the little trophies. And it's we're going to the playoff, and the Rose Bowl is going away as, as we knew it. And um, Ohio State, Michigan is 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 not going to be – I mean, it's going to be the same to those two. But, yeah, I guess my point is we're, we're heading to a place where – and I ask people this at Big Ten Media Days, how many playoff – teams you think the Big Ten will get on a, in, a, in a given year? And, and most people said three. I think it might be four, but the point is you're not, you're not, you're not looking to, to try to get in the top four or top five in the Big Ten. That's, that's going to be the goal. And um, you know what? If Iowa wants to do that, they can. You know, 
Nebraska had no entitlement when when uh, Devaney took over. They, they, they'd never done anything before. So why can't Iowa do it? Why can't Illinois do it if they want to? But they've never wanted to. They've never been wired that way, the way Nebraska is. So, But that's who the Big Ten invited. They invited that into the league when they invited Nebraska in. And now they're inviting USC and their mentality and the everybody else. It's just going to keep going if they go to the ACC. So um, the way I see it uh, on this thing, Sam, is they uh, – Matt Rule is really – in a different spot than Solich or Callahan. Um, if you look at the situation, I'm not saying Nebraska. Very yes, they, very. They, they can't. They, they're, they're, I'm not saying they can ever win an the national championship, but the the charge or order for strength so much was to win the league. When you're a Nebraska football coach, you know Tom Osborne, you won the league. You chased the league title every year. You were up there, and then you, you tried to go to the Orange Bowl or one of the big bowls. Um, that's what people were used to. That's essentially wh- why Frank was fired and Callahan was – everybody I followed, they all fell short of that. Well, I'm not saying those days are gone, but if you look at today's landscape, I mean, trying to win the Big Ten right now, I mean, okay, you know, we'll say Nebraska gets back on its feet, learns how to block, learns how to tackle, and learns how to win, um, and, and and they start winning their share. Well, you got to get in the top four, and that's with Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, USC, right off the top of my head, already up there. Um, and like you said, Oregon, Washington, that's two more games you got to win that are hard games to win. You already have, you know, the other schools. There aren't, aren't a lot of gimmies um, in this league. So I think going forward, um, you know, maybe you, you certainly chase the titles and, and, and um, that's, that's what Wisconsin's going to do. But you have to have a mentality now in Nebraska where, okay, we, we might win a conference title at the same rate we used to win national titles. You know, you're not going to win it all. You're not going to win three or four in a decade. You just, you might. <laughs> That's a hell of a deal if you do. I just think you have to, you have to, you know, Matt Rule right now is 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 playing a different game than so much your Bill Callahan did. Yes, and that was, mm-hmm. you know, you, you you damn well better win the league or else. And um, that's not the case anymore. Not in my mind. And I think the fans. And media and everybody going forward is going to have to adjust to that. If if uh, Matt Rule plays in the Big Ten Championship, there's a chance he'll play in Las Vegas. There's a radio station out of Iowa uh, that just broke that at least a couple of Big Ten Championships in the future will be played at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas, Nevada. Speaking sure. of gambling. <laughs> so, I'm not surprised. I think a lot more stuff is, is going to do that. But, um, I have no problem with that. No. I, I I, like, I would like to see an outdoor Big Ten championship, though. I will say that I, I'm well, not it, against that. It won't be it won't be around here. Uh, it won't be in Chicago. But again, this is my point of the the, the shifting sands of the Big Ten. Um, the Big Ten history. Well, we're going to hear less and less about it. We're going to hear you know, more and more about the playoff and the you know chasing the titles. And now you get Wisconsin. They're they're. They're 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 out of the, out out in front of this thing, okay. It's going to change, and we're we're here now. We're ready to go right now. We're going to go after championships. That's Luke Fickle. Um, oh, that's what it's going to take. And Nebraska is already wired that way. They just got to start learning how to win. And um, by the one more thing, that Washington game was my third game at the World Herald. Uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, Nebraska, you know, you say Washington was it was a, a tipping point for them. It might have been a tipping point for Nebraska. Their their mentality was already on the ropes. They had lost the last three games the previous year, uh, heartbreaking fashion to Colorado at home, uh, blown out of Oklahoma. Then they lose the bowl game to uh, Georgia Tech, and people were upset with Osborne offense stinks. Uh, antiquated. We better start pe- throwing the ball, um, so on and so forth. Osborne's out there. They're trying to fire me, and they weren't. But that was the mentality. 
and then you collapse in the fourth quarter. I, I, I remember it was a night game. I remember spending the night in Lincoln so I could get up early and go see Charlie McBride the next morning. I got to the offices, South Stadium offices, about 8 a.m., and Charlie was already there. He'd been up all night. He'd had phone – people got his phone number. They were calling him all night, calling his wife names. Um, and I got this inter- great interview with Charlie, and all of a sudden, here comes Tom. Well, Charlie, you, you about done. We got some work to do. And um, Charlie got up and went right into there and went and watched the film. But um, – um, yeah, that that was an interesting time. You know, Nebraska they 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 bounced back, but but that was, that was a devastating loss on ABC National, mm-hmm. um, Saturday Night Stage, and they collapsed after losing the last three previous year. So, uh, the Unity Council was coming into form, as was uh, the the four three defense, and Tommy Frazier were not far behind. But um, anyway, that was uh, those were interesting times. It was uh, Nebraska only lost two games that year. They lost to the national champions, Washington and Miami. And then they had a tie against Colorado at the snowball game. Um, so they had a pretty good season. And then 92 Frazier comes and you could kind of sense the. Well, Washington, the didn't Washington, weren't, weren't they co national they champs? Co national yeah. champs with Miami. Yep. Yeah, they, they, they won. They won they the lost to both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Miami won the, won the AP. The following year, Miami and Alabama were able to play each other for the national title, and Alabama hammered Miami. And that was kind of the end of it for, for Miami for a little while. I, I know they won another national championship, I think, in, a, in 2000 or 2001. I can't remember what year. They yeah, J- it again, but yeah. Jimmy's players were out, and uh, I don't know if he didn't quite have the, although <laughs> he, had good. Lewis, he had, don't forget, Ray Lewis and Warren Sapp. So, pretty good. yeah, he had a couple good ones. Yeah, they were they were pretty darn special. Um, another news: uh, Nebraska volleyball's uh, uh, um, playing in Memorial Stadium has inspired the Iowa women's basketball team to play a game in Kinnick Stadium, an exhibition game. So there you go. Um, they're going to do that in October. Uh, so Nebraska is just spawning all kinds of uh, bright ideas all over the place. Let's move to Nebraska football. Um, Evan, we're you know we're almost through two weeks of camp. I don't know. It's been all that lightning. Um, I wasn't able to be there on Tuesday uh, when they had open practice. I don't know that you learn a whole lot from that. Um, increasingly, you know, since Mike Riley is no longer the coach, it's it can get kind of hard actually to to fully assess everything that's going on because just, they just won't let us watch it. Um, maybe they don't think we're gonna, you know, they think we're gonna narc or say something that we weren't supposed to or whatever. But the bottom line is. Um, we haven't watched practice in a long time. And so it's always hard to kind of project exactly what's going to happen. I remember two years ago, well, we thought Nebraska was going to be a house on fire going out to Illinois and they laid an egg out there. And I know the game was an eight point game, but they stunk for three quarters. Uh, and then um, last year at Northwestern, I think we all kind of felt like, Oh boy, they're going to have a pass rush, man. Look out, look out, look out. And their, their pass rush sucked. <clears throat> It wasn't any good, and they lost in Northwestern, only game that Northwestern won 31-28. So all those things are true. Saying all that, having given this long preamble as to, like, disclaimer, um, which side of the ball do you trust more right now? Man, I, I've said some things on this podcast over the years in relation to that that's been wildly inaccurate uh, for all the reasons that you laid out, and and it's even more so this year with the new staff and the transfer portal acceleration um so you don't even really even know all the guys like in their abilities based on what we saw from them last year but you know it's it's interesting because i agree with kind of what we've talked about before about this idea that it's probably going to take the defense a little bit longer to to settle into the 335 reality and whatever that might be but, but I still think that's the side of the ball that Nebraska is going to have to lean on this year. And they have a lot of dudes over there. Uh, you know, I think their linebackers are all uh, really trustworthy guys. Uh, we all know the names, the secondaries, a strength, even with Miles Farmer transferring out and Marquise Buford on the mend. Like they just, they're, they're just a lot of guys that you can point to and say, you know, this guy could, could be really good. That guy could be really good. This guy's done it. Um, you know, defensive line still kind of remains 
that question mark beyond Ty Robinson, but you know, you, you, you see guys like Blaze Gunnerson and Nash Hutmacher and, and you can see it, right? Like you can kind of see what another off season has done for them, what some of the freshmen have. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard about Cam Lenhart and what he is able to do. We'll see to what extent as a true freshman in the big 10, but I still just, I, I guess I just feel like that's the side of the ball. Nebraska is going to have to lean on this year. Uh, you know, you, you wonder about the, I wonder about the offense and especially if Jeff Sims were to get hurt, what that attack could look like. I, I still am in kind of prove it mode with the offensive line, even though there are so many familiar faces, like show me that you can run the ball and that you're committed to running the ball. I just, I'm not totally bought into that until I see it happen. There's a lot of potential at tight end, but to me, again, it's, it's the proven leadership on the defensive side. Uh, I like, Tony White, the coordinator, like he he's, he strikes me as a guy who's absolutely going to have them ready to go. So if I had to pick a side, I, I guess it would be the defense as being a strength for Nebraska moving into the season. Mm, okay, so you trust the defense. Here's what I'll say. There's, there's two different kinds of trust, right? So there's this idea that which side of the ball is better, right? Um, and then there's this idea of uh, you, you trust – you trust one side of the ball to be exactly what it is, and you will know if it's successful or unsuccessful based on X. And I would say it's offense. I have a pretty good sense, I think, of what they will be good at or what they could be good at. And if they're not good at that, what they will do as a curveball and the challenges that will be presented if they're not able to do the thing that they want to do. And the thing that I think they really want to do is run the football with a running back, um, you know, Use the quarterback in the run game as needed. Throw short to intermediate passes. Don't throw it deep a lot. Control the football. Um, you know, try to eat time off the clock and, and try to score, you know, 24 to 28 points in Big Ten games and win some of them. I think they have a pretty sense, pretty good sense of what they want to do to mess with defenses in terms of personnel packages and, um, you know, other areas of like huddling up and shifts and motions and things like that. Um, I don't know that that group of that side of the ball will be better, but I do think that they'll have a structure to it um, that will make sense to fans and to reporters. The defensive side of the ball, I think, could be a boom bust thing uh, any given week. I, I think they could have weeks where we're just we're we're really impressed, and then I think they could have weeks where you're just like, I don't. They 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 blitzed into the wrong thing. They got beat four times in the first half, and they're down twenty four to ten because they just made the wrong check or the wrong call or whatever. So part of me is going to say, maybe if the defense is better, I still know what I think the offense is going to be. And that's the area that, that I would say, I trust the offense to be what it is, whether it's good or not. What do you think, Tom? Well, I don't trust anything <laughs> because I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm beaten down, man. I'm beaten down after six years of this. Um, I, I I tend to agree with you. I think I, mean, I want to trust the offensive line. I want to trust the running backs. I think there's a there's some that there's some good running backs there, and I want to trust a running quarterback who is uh, a a big body guy who knows how to run. And um, but I don't know if I can trust the coordinator to call those plays yet. I don't know um, if I can trust this team inside the. the uh, the old red zone, which has been so hard to break through. Um, I don't know yet, but I, I want to trust the coaching staff to make adjustments on the fly. So when there are holes that, uh, you know, the, the leagues have sprang open, they, they, they fix them in a hurry and they're um, willing to play to the, uh, the, uh, the personnel on the field and they're willing to go the you know, offense help defense defense if defense is having a tough day keep the ball on the ground keep the other offense away you know i hope i help each other out a little bit um and i'm wanting to trust that special teams is going to add to the mix as well so um i think offense has probably got more potential I just don't know if they they don't have the dudes in on defense. They've got some, but they don't have enough. And we we get too worried about scheme around here. 
And they don't have the you know, Nebraska's defense was great when they had dudes, and they don't have all the dudes yet. So uh, I mentioned they had the dudes on offense. They might have a few more. And you know, I I I, I keep something is gonna if they're gonna go to a bowl and have a you know that kind of year, somebody's gonna have to surprise us. There's gonna be something we maybe didn't see coming, or uh, it, it might be a player, it, it, it might be tight ends, it might be a running back who 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 really uh, you know has a a, a a a a breakout year. Uh, might be the offensive line. I, I I don't. I think I see more potential on offense. Than I do defense for that. But um, you know, it's um, <laughs> I just I don't. I don't want to say I don't trust anybody, but I, I, I'm going to sit back and watch. Yeah, I think I think the offensive line is going to be better than it's been in the past um, several years. I do have questions about the defensive line. Wide receiver is the biggest question mark, and 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 this is, um, you know, this this is this is an ongoing thing for Nebraska, where where they've really struggled, and one of the reasons why I think you want to run the football while you're at Nebraska is they have had the damnedest time over the course of however many years getting wide receivers in there. They just, it just hasn't been easy for them to do. And as a result, and I'm not trying to knock anybody that might be moving up the depth chart, but gosh, darn, like Ohio state's rolling out first round draft picks. That's why they throw the ball 45 times a game. They're throwing at guys that are elite. If you don't have great receivers, it can actually be hard to be like an elite passing team, you you know, like most quarterbacks can't just magically get guys open. So it makes sense to me that they want to run the football more and they've got to try to find ways to get that done without beating their quarterback to, to a pulp by mid season. And Adrian Martinez was beat by a pulp by mid season, every single year he was here. And Tommy was too. I mean, Tommy was tougher he was about as tough as they get, but even he missed a couple of games in 2016 because he didn't have a hamstring. So you got to find a way to get this done without, without turning Jeff Sims into a running back. And, um, you know, when Jerry DiNardo on BTN said, well, Hey, you know, I mean, this guy's like a big running back. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's, that's not ideal though. That's not what you want. You, you want a guy that, that can run at, at times, but doesn't have to turn into a tank for you to win football oh. games. But he may have to be that for them to win six games. It's very possible that he has to run twenty times a game to do it. I, I Sam, I, I, I want to say that, that uh, you, you're right on that. But we have to look at Jeff Sims through the uh, the lens of he might be a, a one year guy. He might just be the guy to get them through this first year. Um, and so they got to do what they got to do. And um, I'm not saying he's going away, but they are bringing other quarterbacks in. I just you, right now they just need to get through this first year, and, and um, that and that means running the quarterback. And I think that's um, I, mean, I really think it'll be interesting to see Rule how he uh, manages the young guys and the, against the old guys who plays the urgency to win as opposed to maybe you, you're, you're you're trying to build and and keep guys from uh, transferring out. Uh, it's a whole different world now, but. Yeah, I mean, if I, I can look at Sims and go, hey, if, if running him, if that gets you to a bowl game, then by God, you got to run him. And um, so it's um, – and, 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 you know, again, you, the receivers, I just feel like the roster is a year or two away still. And I feel like we're, they're kind of caught in this uh, no man's land almost of not quite there yet. but. They were, God, they, how close have they been the last year or two in some of these games? They didn't finish, so, but. Um, they had a pretty good roster in 2021, and they, they had a hard schedule, and they under yeah. That was I mean, the year where I think they could have been eight and four if they're not having to play Michigan and Ohio State. They just got a, they got a raw deal there. Yeah. And they effed up the Michigan State game. That's their fault. Nebraska screwed that up. That could have been a pretty good football team, I think, and they they had a good roster. This roster is not nearly, in my opinion, is not as good as 2021 right. and not as good as 2019, and they blew it that year. That was Frost just poor, just poorly coached the football team in 2019. Yeah. 
Well, and I'll be curious too, just the, you know, you talk about running the quarterback and what they want to do. It's all, it's all good until you're in the third quarter in a tight game against whoever Minnesota and you have to make a decision, right? Third and six at midfield, you're going to run that quarter, run that running back between the tackles, or are yeah. you going to drop back and let Jeff Sims do his thing? Like, that's why, you know, this part of the of the season or, or preseason kind of hits that grind because we know what they want to do now. We know what the plan is. We know kind of the vision, but what does it look like in those, when the, when the live bullets are out there and you have to get a conversion and you're feeling the pressure, right? Do you convert back and, and indulge in that, quarterback run sweet tooth or do you stick to what you're doing and and maybe it doesn't work and you can you keep sticking with it i mean we saw the opposite last year if nebraska couldn't uh run on on, on first down on the first play of the game it felt like they abandoned uh that that facet of their attack the rest of the way so their commitment to what they want to do when it doesn't always work is something that i'll be fascinated to follow as well last year was painful to watch at times on offense for <laughs> sure um and and they actually had a, a pretty good quarterback in my opinion um, and they just there's a lot of things they just couldn't do um, because they had one they had one or two good receivers they didn't really have a run game plan that worked and it, yeah it was it was rough last year for for sure um, we'll end on a brief note on basketball um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this Nebraska goes three and zero in its exhibition series in Spain that finished last Saturday there's been a lot going on though um, right before they went to Spain they added a kid by the name of Matar Jop. Uh, who Diop job? I mean, it's probably Diop, but you could. I, I've heard it pronounced both ways. Six nine kid uh, who's who's got some size to him, and uh, and and the guy that they like as a rim protector and as a lob threat, and that means you know alley oops. Um, then we learned that Blaze Key didn't go on the trip at all because of a because of a passport issue, which isn't good. I you know, he's got ankle issues, and there's other things there, and it just doesn't seem to be a great situation. Then we learn Aaron Euless uh, is caught up in the Iowa gambling scandal and may not be a part of the program. I mean, he, he might be part of the program, but I don't know if he'll be playing. It's hard to know exactly what's going to happen there. Um, you know, he's been charged with uh, with one charge and he had made a lot of bets through. I mean, we mentioned this last week, FanDuel, and it was made through the, the FanDuel app. Um, so that was that was interesting and notable. Uh, so Euless isn't a part of it uh, right now. Um then they had a bunch of guys hurt, uh, so they they played a lot of walk-ons while they were in Spain and freshmen. And then they had Jaron Boogie Coleman on Sunday. It's kind of a surprise addition. He went into the transfer portal uh, last week because he graduated, so he could go into the transfer portal at his own time and his own pace. Michael Lewis, who used to be a former Nebraska basketball assistant, was not pleased. His his message that he put out was clearly very frustrated that they. They felt like they helped this kid graduate over the summer, and then he 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 rewarded them by leaving, <laughs> and and uh, and he's gone, and now he's at Nebraska. What's interesting about this guy is he spent one year, Tom, at Missouri, two years ago. He was he transferred from Ball State to Missouri, then transferred back to Ball State from Missouri, and now he's going to Nebraska. And he, I, I, you know, he wasn't great at Missouri. Uh, maybe he wasn't going to be able to work under the new coach, Dennis Gates. But that is, that's, that's the up to date story on that program. I mean, they got a lot of moving parts. It, 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 Nebraska basketball is just, it's all over the place. You don't know exactly what the roster is going to end up as. Yeah, it, it doesn't bode well. I don't think for uh, uh, team building, and that's what a lot of these trips are for. Um, but it's, it's hard to build a team and chemistry. Like you said, when you're all over the place and you don't know who's going to be there and who you got people coming in, um, I don't know. It's um, yeah, you, you, you know, and in today's world, you're going to lose a few. You you're going to gain a few from the portal, but you certainly would would like to have the roster a lot more set. <laughs> um, and, and and they've got a lot of nice pieces too. Um, I don't know. I. Uh, they've got the the, the big kid from uh, uh, the Bradley transfer, um, you know, um, Rick Mast. Juwan Gary's going to be good, really good. I think he could be a leader. Um, but um, like you said, just a lot of moving parts. So, uh, you know, get the ball to Casey, just get him the ball and uh, let him shoot. And, um, but, um, 
Yeah, it's never a dull moment. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting team. I'll, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. I I agree with you on Kase. I don't know that he's going to be the team's leading scorer. I think Bryce Williams, the shallow transfer, will be a big part of it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It just it, it, it at this moment, what I really felt like they needed to do over the summer was get a point guard who can just run the show and not worry about scoring. And that was Sam Griesel. I feel like they got a bunch of guys that are going to want to score. So they've got to figure out a way with one ball to make yeah. sure that the right guys are getting the ball all the time. One thing I'll say about Casey, when Casey gets the ball in his hands, Casey's going to shoot. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just, that's just the reality of the story. He shoots a lot. Um, so the ball at times, he moves well without it and he will get to the rim. But once the ball gets to him, you, you can feel pretty good that he's going to go ahead and do something with it that goes toward the rim. So uh, the ball at yeah. times kind of stops with him and, and that's okay. Uh, he makes points and he makes plays, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. That is our pick six podcast for this week. We're going to be back next week to do and get a little bit more in depth with our position previews and just, Hey, let's, let's, let's start going through the schedule. We're getting to the time of the college football special section. Tom will have a column in there. Evan and I will break down the positions in the special section. People love that thing every single year. I think we'll have some fun art plan. So um yep we're steaming on we're in mid-august and we're going all the way to uh hey we're 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 three weeks away today from nebraska at minnesota uh for thursday night in the twin cities for tom and evan i'm sam thanks for listening mm-hmm.